can just kind of run through the solutions for these and kind of where the points were, what you need to do to earn points and all that kind of stuff, just to treat this as like a full on learning opportunity. That sound okay to you guys? Yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. Let me just find all my papers here. Um, and then as you guys figured out, thankfully you guys figured out um, and were able to tell me on the um, on here that the uh, I had messed up and I had mislabeled like which one was calculator and no calculator. So the one that I told you guys not to use the calculator on was supposed to be the calculator one and the one I let you use the calculator on was supposed to be the no calculator one. So um, with that being said, when I went to score these things using the, the guidelines or whatever, if you did the non-calculator one with a calculator, you weren't going to even be able to get maximum points available because there was like work shown that you needed to get to to get points. So some of you guys that got like the right answers on um, the, the first page, may not have gotten full marks for it because if you just punched into your calculator to get the number, you missed out on some intermediate points there. I think, Paul, I labeled yours correctly when you took it early. Somehow I managed to do that and messed up everybody else. <laughs> so, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's not my best moment. Okay. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's run through this. So all of these um, for response questions are always going to have, they're going to be nine points each. They're not going to tell you how they divvied up the nine points between the problems or between the parts, but every, every one of these is going to be a nine points total. Um, so for number one, it says R is the region enclosed by the graphs of G of X and H of X the y-axis and the vertical line x equals 2 as in the, shown in the picture above. Starts off asking us to find the area of R. This one should have been relatively easy to get some points out of. Um, so this is just the area between two curves, right? It's like a 6-1 problem. Really the only difficulty here at the initial setup point would be figuring out which one of these is which, right? Which line corresponds to g of x and which line corresponds to h of x. Um, the easiest thing to do would just be, okay, at x equals zero, what does this give me? Well, I know cosine of zero is one, so that would be negative two plus three. So that's g and this one is h. Right? I don't have to do much, but I do need to figure that out initially to know which one's on top and which one's on bottom. Um, if you guys, oh, by the way, if you guys weren't here to take the homework quiz, you don't need to make it up. Like these problems are on the one note. Like I would do it, I would do the practice, um, but you don't need to like set aside a special time to do this since they didn't count for a grade. It was just, just practice that we did in class is what it's gonna turn into. Cool. You can share that with uh, Tegan or whatever if he's ever comes to class again. <laughs> I know it's ski season. I get it. I don't know what's going on today, but I think he's like in like the Michigan state. Ah, like, uh, okay. So to find the area between two curves, how do I do that? It's the integral from. 0 to 2, and again, you got that just by looking at the picture, right? Okay, and then... Yep. So having this written down would have been one point. And you could have put in the actual functions for h of x and g of x, but just getting that on the paper, anywhere on your paper, one point. That's 
should have been able to get that, right? But here's the thing. You have to have you have to have the bounds, correct? You have to have the DX at the end. Like you have to have the integral symbol. You have to have like the parenthesis around the H of X minus G of X. If you wrote it symbolic, if you wrote the functions, you had to distribute the negative through or use a parenthesis to like you have to get all that details right to get that point. But it should have been a relatively easy point to get. Okay. So let's go ahead and do then the uh, start doing the calculus here. Now this was supposed to be the uh, the no calculator problem, so I'm going to do this as a no calculator problem and talk about where the the intermediate work that would have accomplished earning points along the way. Everybody's cool still. So I just substituted those values in. So let's start doing our antiderivatives. So I can just do this piece by piece, right? Antiderivative of 6 is 6x. The antiderivative of negative 2x minus 1 quantity squared. You could FOIL it out, sure, if you wanted to do that. You know what I would do though? U sub. I would U sub this. What would the U be? X minus one. What's the what's the derivative of X minus one? One. So dx is just equal to du. So this just becomes like negative two u minus or uh, x minus one to the third over three. So I just I can treat the x over x minus one as just my u and then just slap it back in there. Very easy to do that in my head. You could have also foiled it out and done that though, Victoria. There's nothing wrong with doing it that way. Um, the antiderivative for the 2 is 2x. And then the antiderivative for 3 cosine pi over 2x. Very good. So I heard Paul whisper u sub again. That was you, Paul, right? I want to give you credit when you say good, when you have good ideas. So that's a u sub problem as well. So du is going to be, or du dx is going to be just pi over 2, correct? So dx is equal to, yeah, 2 du over pi is dx. So we're going to have... 3 times 2 over pi, and then the antiderivative for cosine is negative sine, and then we're going to just stick our u back in there. Evaluated from 0 to 2. Getting just this antiderivative correct was one point. Getting everything else was one point. So again, if you did this with a calculator, you couldn't have gotten those points, right? When Mr. Kulik told you you could use the calculator on this one when he shouldn't have. So those, if you missed two points and you did everything else correctly, that was, you probably would have been able to get those two points had you just 
not use the calculator. Nico. How come you didn't do the du dx or du over dx for the first sub? Well, because it, because du is just going to equal dx. Oh, okay. So I don't have to worry about it because the derivative of x minus 1 is just 1. So I multiply the dx over it and just du equals dx. Thank you. It's like the easiest use of kind of situation. But it saves me a minute if I don't have to FOIL, mm -hmm. right? And maybe those minutes will be important. Maybe they won't. Depends on how quick you are. But, you know, the idea is to just kind of, as we go through and do these, we're going to talk about ways to save time, ways to see it the easier way to do it than the brute force way of doing it. Nothing wrong with the brute force if that's what you notice, but I want to like keep kind of talking through tricks and stuff as we go. All right, and then the last step here would be to plug stuff in, right? So when I plug 2 in, I get 12 minus, when I plug 2 in there, I get 1. So that just becomes 1 times 2 thirds plus 4 minus, uh, when I plug 2 in here, I get pi. What sign of pi? <laughs> zero. zero. That's lovely. And then we have minus 0. When I plug 0 in for this, I get negative 1. Negative 1 to the third is positive 1, so that's going to, or I'm sorry, it's negative 1, so that's going to be positive 2 thirds, though. Everybody still doing okay? Got a zero. Sine of zero is also zero. Hmm. I don't know, whatever, zero. Doesn't matter. Probably minus there. Okay. Um, did I goof the sign up on that? Because that's supposed to be subtracting, so there's three negatives there, right? That's supposed to be minus. Okay. So what do I have? I have 16 minus 4 thirds. I just stop here. That's correct. I wouldn't care. I don't believe that they care if the answer is fully simplified or not. Don't waste your time making a common denominator, giving yourself the opportunity to make a stupid arithmetic mistake with no calculator. I would stop there. I, you even leave that as the one I think you could probably even leave it as the one before and still be okay. Um, but this is the final point here. So there's four points possible on that first problem. Because they had you do all the integration, you had to do a U sub in there. Um, there's no way to do the cosine one without the u sub. That's why it got its own s special point to it. If you start doing something, you have to do like two or three u subs, you're doing something wrong. They're not going to have something that complicated. Um, all right. So that's part one or part A. Part B then says R is the base of a solid. For the solid, each x or i'm sorry at each x the cross section perpendicular to the x axis has area a of x equals 1 over x plus 3 find the volume of the solid this sounds complicated right it's not what's the volume formula Integral of a to b of a of x dx. That's it, right? Did they give you a of x? Yep. What are going to be the bounds of integration, the a and b? 0 to 2. That's all we're doing. So this... was one point. The second point is going to be for the answer.
How do I do the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 3? <coughs> U sub, great. What's the U going to be? X plus 3. So du is just dx. And what's the antiderivative in place here? Natural log, absolute value of X plus 3, evaluated from 0 to 2. So I do that, I get natural log of 5 minus natural log of 2, or I'm sorry, 3. Could stop there. That would be your final point. Or you could have written this as natural log of 5 thirds. That would be okay also. Again, no reason to do that, especially on a non-calculator one. Don't waste your energy trying to like simplify your final answer. Once you have a numeric final answer, just stop. Don't don't make give yourself the opportunity to do something dumb and like say that's the natural log of two or something. Everybody's cool? Okay. Um, C, I think between the two parts, I think this was the most difficult piece. Write but do not evaluate an integral expression that gives the volume of the solid generated when R is rotated about the horizontal line Y equals 6. Oh, I'm sorry, not this one. This was not that bad. I must be part C of the other one that I was thinking of. So where is my line Y equals 6 at? It's right there, correct? So what shape cross section is each gonna of these gonna have when I rotate that about that line y equals six? It'll be a washer. Okay. What will the inner radius be? Be like that. What would the outer radius be? It would be like that. everybody okay with that all right so let's kind of start putting that together what are my bounds of integration going to be still zero to two okay so what's the outer radius there going to be good six minus h of x Squared, good. Okay. So, oh, not h of x though, guys, right? It's g of x. Because look at our outer, not our, our inner. We're doing outer. That's what they uh, well, yeah, so like, let's just assume that this is the point like, you know, uh, like one negative two or something. How far is that distance going to be then? Here to here is six. That's two. So it's going to be six minus a negative two. Is that... If you're not sure, like, am I adding or subtracting, like, just kind of, like, drawing a hypothetical value and just, you know what I mean, Victoria? Does that feel okay? Um, if you just kind of common sense it out, it oftentimes is like, okay, yep, that's, that's what I have to do. All right. Absolutely. And then... Um, the other one is 6 minus h of x, then. Just having the limits and the, um, the constant here, that was one point. 
getting the pi in there and getting the limits of integration. Catching that you had like r outer squared minus r inner squared. That was one point. And then getting that these should be 6 minus was one point. I think you could, yeah, I think you could, and it would be okay. So especially since they say write but do not integrate, I think you'd be okay writing it, just h of x and g of x. I would argue for it, if I were the one grading it, that this would, is acceptable since we declared that h of x and g of x were those. And that's safer as well, right? Less chance to make some kind of dumb typo writing something down wrong or misdistributing a negative, right? Um, but that's, that's the three points there. Again, if you know, if you see what to do past the first one, these last two parts were not that difficult, right? But you just had to recognize what you needed to do. Um, in fact, I think you guys got the easier two problems. I think first hour got the two I gave first hour a little harder than your guys is probably. I can share their problems with you guys if you're interested. Okay. All right, so this problem was calculator optional. So you could use your calculator to do these pieces. Um, so it wants the solid, or it says let R be the region closed by the graph. So there's the picture with R labeled of f of x and y equals 4, as shown above. So we want the volume of the solid generated when r is rotated about the line y equals negative 2. So something down here. Everybody okay there? What is the, uh, what is the shape of the cross section for that going to be? It's going to be a washer. Good. So we have pi integral. So our r inner would be that, and our outer would be that. Okay. What's the value for our outer? Yeah, I'm just going to write it as 6 squared. Because the distance from the y-axis, or from the x-axis to y equals 4 is 4, and the distance from y equals negative 2 to the x-axis is 2. So it's just 2 plus 4. Okay, and what's our inner going to be? Yeah. And then we still need our squares in there. dx. And we still need one other piece here, though. What do we need? We need the bounds. So how am I going to get the bounds? Right, but what am I going to do with my calculator to get the bounds? Yeah, I plug 4 into y. Right? And this we can actually do by hand if we felt like it. Oops. So I can subtract the 4 over and then factor the right hand side. So I get x equals 0 and x equals 2.3. Or you could have done it in your calculator, just graphed it and found the intersections. That's okay too. Okay, so uh, there are four points for this problem. The bounds were one point. 
the form of the integral was one point. So noticing it was a washer and then getting these guys correct was one point. And then the answer, which we'll just type into our calculator, is our fourth point. Um, now, I want to just make mention that even though these two examples we've done, the four point prob or the four point part was the, uh, the part A for both of them, that's not really going to be the case. Okay, that was just a happy coincidence here. I don't even know if it's happy as much as it just was a coincidence. And then I'm going to just write this as plus 6 here instead of 2 plus whatever. So 98, 68, or I'm sorry, 87. And then I don't think they care, but it's a volume, so it's cubic units or whatever. But I don't think they care about that unit unless it says specifically in the directions that with correct units or something. All right. Part B says R is the base of a solid, or the region R is the base of a solid. For this solid, each cross section perpendicular to the x-axis is an isosceles triangle with a leg in R. Find the volume of the solid. So I'm going to erase my marks here. So if I'm cross-sectioning perpendicular to x, I'm taking that. So that distance would be like a leg length, right? Everybody's okay with that? How do I find the uh, area for an isosceles triangle? Or for any triangle, I guess. Okay. And if it's an isosceles triangle, Well, that's awful nice because what is L in this case going to be? Yeah, the distance between the functions. So that would just be 4 minus f of x. So we're going to be integrating from what bounds? 0 to 2.3. 1 half L squared dx. So this was two points here. I assume that we had one point here and then one point for the area of the cross-section form being correct, and then one point for the length of that side being correct, and then we have one point for the answer. And I guess when I said this, um, this is true because it's a right isosceles triangle. That was in the direction, right? Not any isosceles triangle is just going to be one half like squared, but any right. Wait, could you draw the uh, not really, because it's going to be like, so if I tried to draw this, um, in three dimensions or whatever to show where the triangle is going to be. It's like 
absurdly difficult. Um, so this thing is like somehow like coming up to a point here. So it's like some kind of weird, it's got like a, like a shark fin almost. Um, so when you cross section it through, you get like, like a right isosceles triangle coming out of it. It's super hard to visualize. I can't even really visualize it well in my head. Um, the key for me though was perpendicular to the x-axis. So I know that this is the leg. Oops. And then it's a isosceles right triangle with a leg in R. So if I know that's what the cross section looks like, I don't actually have to visualize what that's going to be. I know what I know how to find that leg length and I know the area formula for that cross section. That's all I care about. And I'm just not going to try to visual, spend a lot of time visualizing because it's hard sitting there and trying to think about what that's going to look like in three dimensions is like really difficult. But I've seen a bunch of like free response questions with this kind of phrasing uh, where it's like, I think they do it intentionally because it's really hard to visualize it. But they're giving you everything they need, everything you need in the problem. They're telling you how to find the piece you need and telling you the cross-sectional area formula you need to use. Don't spend a bunch of time trying to visualize it. I think it's a like a red herring in that regard. Just know that it's like, hey, I'm just integrating cross-sections. Tells me how to find the cross-sectional area and the pieces I need for the cross-section. Just gonna plug it in and go. Does that feel okay, Elvis? Yeah. Because I, I agree, I spent some time when I read that trying to visualize what it looked like and I, I had a very hard time doing it and eventually came to the conclusion that like, okay, I think that's what it probably looks like, but it didn't help me one little bit in coming up with an answer. Um, put the one half out here, I think. And again, notice that on the calculator section, I am not doing any calculus by hand. I am using my calculator to do all of it. I'm writing down the setup on my sheet of paper, but I am not about to do any integration by hand. It is not, um, there's not enough time. In all, in all reality, to be able to do it. Um, so I'm just saving myself the, uh, oh my God, what did I do, guys? Look at what I typed in. What am I missing? Forgot to square it. Dur, dur, dur. There we go. 357. And then this C, I thought was like the trickiest one of the bunch, says the vertical line Y equals K divides R into two regions of equal area. So let's just kind of sketch something in. So there's x equals k. Write but do not solve an equation involving integral expressions whose solution gives the value of k. So basically you want to say that this area is equal to that area. Well, it's just two area between two curve problems, right? That have to be equal. Everybody agree with that? So the first area is from 0 to k of 4 minus f of x dx. And that has to equal the integral from 
k to 2.3 of the same thing, 4 minus f of x dx. Um, and then it says that you got one point for doing that, getting the cross-sectional area of one of the regions correct, and then one point for the rest of it. So in general, some feedback for you guys from what I see, based on what you guys turned into me. We could do a bit better job of like writing things down, right? Some of us were really disorganized and it made it really hard for me as a grader kind of sorting through what was going on. We need to be real careful when you write an integral that you have like the dx's in there, that you have like the bounds written in somewhere. Um, even on these calculator parts where it's all gonna be punched into the calculator, you gotta write it down so we can see what you did. Um, you gotta have the notation correct or else I don't think you're gonna get points for the integrands being correct if you don't have like a dx on there. Um, in general, I think you guys probably wrote too much. Like use the f of x, the g of x, use the shortcut way of writing it. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. It saves you like a bunch of time making sure you've copied things correctly and like manipulating things algebraically, particularly on the calculator parts. Like there's no reason to write out all the whole function name when you can just call it f of x or g of x. And even if it had in a problem like this, you could just say let g of x equal four or something and like give that a name. So you can just use that in the problem, I think would be okay. Like if it's y equals and then something complicated, you can just say let, you know, g of x or f of x or whatever you want to call it equal the thing and then just use that notation in your work should be okay because you've declared it on your page so like do like think of ways like that to kind of save yourself some copying and like just opportunities to make dumb transcription mistakes where you just copied something wrong which is so frustrating but like as an ap grader if it's wrong on your paper and you can tell it's just copied wrong doesn't matter right like it just whether you forgot that you had a dx and then it disappeared, I don't think that would give you, I don't think the grader would give you point for it. So just finding as little ways of, you know, making a mess out of that kind of stuff as we can, I think would go a long way. Um, all right. Um, so the chapter six test here is coming up because we finished six five. My plan here is to do 7-1 next class as just kind of a standalone and then do the chapter 6 test the following class period. So that's Wednesday next week. Um, just because I think it would be helpful for you guys to have another chance to work on the review and the chapter 6 homework and come back with some more questions, particularly after the weekend. Feels like that would be nice. And I want, I spent like half the class here going through these problems, which not that this was not review for us, but I think that that would be, would be helpful. Um, so the, on the review, I have the test format here written out for you guys. So we have three questions that are these like chapter five leftover problems where we used uh, completing the square or polynomial division to integrate one of these rational functions. Um, a little bit later on, I'm gonna go back and show another method that we have for like integrating rational functions that uh, don't fit in either of those two cases, which is super fun. Um, so, and I give you a couple of examples there. On these ones, I would expect you to show your work, so I'd want to see the U substitutions. I'd want to see the algebraic manipulation to a point. Um, 
on 4 through 8, I'm just going to ask you to set up the definite integral and then use your calculator to compute the area. You don't need to show me anything, just show the setup and show the answer from the calculator. You don't have to do any of that integration by hand. This is Mr. Kulik trying to find ways to save us some time in class when you're working on this to make sure it's a one class period doable test. Um, so area between curves, solids generated by road revolution. Um, so those are the different kinds of problems here. Notice that there's, I have like, what do we have? We have three volumes of revolution problems. What do you suppose the three types of cross sections you're going to see are? Disc, washer, shell. I would count on seeing that. Yep. Yeah. There's three problems. There's three techniques. Boy, it seems like that to be something Mr. Kulik would do. Um, you have one work story problem that's similar to what I have here. <laughs> this one? This should be, this one should be pretty easy. This is easier than the hardest ones from the homework, for sure. Why is this one easy? Yeah, it's a rectangular prism is the shape of the thing being emptied. Why does that make it easier? The cross-sectional area of the water being pumped out is constant. It's not like the cone where the circle kept getting smaller and smaller and we had to like really jump through some hoops to describe that. Here it's a constant, which is lovely. Makes life massively easier. Um, and then I have two average value problems. One of them where you have an equation, one of them where you have a graph. Um, you can throw over the yeah, sure. All right. So, uh, all right, let's do this. Yeah, I was going to say. No. It just comes from your ear. No, it is. Like, sometimes when I'm driving, I just all right, so Luke, you're talking up. Shh. Clicky McClickerson, easy on the pen. Um, you're asking for number 15 then, Luke? That's what you're talking about? So at this point, we're just going to transition into questions from you guys. So homework, review, whatever is okay with me. All right. So F av is the integral from, let's see, 8 to 0, or 0 to 8, I should say, of F of x dx. So I have 1 eighth times. And then this is just the area under the curve, right? So I have negative a half for this spot. And then positive a half, positive a half. So that's one. And then what is this guy? That looks like a triangle with base one and height two. And then I have a square here that's a two by two. And then I have this triangle here that's just a little halfy. I have those two squares there. And then I have another triangle that's got a base of one and a height of two. Oh, yeah, I see what I did. And I think if you just add all that stuff up, I think we should be good to go. Victoria? Five. From the same section? Sure.
So here we're going to be doing um, the integral from 0 to pi over 2 of e to the sine t times cosine t dt. Okay. Woof, this looks terrible, right? How are we going to do this integral? U sub, I agree. What's the U got to be? Sine T. The derivative of sine T is cosine T. So DU is just going to equal cosine T DT. So that looks good because that's right there. So F av is going to be 1 over pi over 2 minus 0, integral from pi over 2 to 0 of e to the u du. Well, 1 or 0, or pi over 2 minus 0 is just pi over 2. 1 over pi over 2 is just 2 over pi, just the reciprocal. The integral of e to the u is e to the u. And I guess we should have done this too, right? Should do u of 0 and u of pi over 2. Let's do that. That'll make life easier. Sine of 0 is 0. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. So Wait, I just, why are we doing this again? So I don't have to plug, I don't have to plug the, uh, sine back into yeah. The you could do it that way and just leave the bounds the same. That's okay to do also. Yep. Either either way of doing it is fine. I'm going to do it this way because, boy, that looks a heck of a lot nicer, right? And I don't know what how they wrote this. Maybe this in the back of the book, but... Yeah, any of those is fine. Or gave, even giving a decimal there would be okay, right? Not a big deal. And hey, you know what I would say for you guys for like test time? Even if it's a show your work spot, if you do this and then you just give me the decimal, by plugging the original into the calculator. If you get me through the antiderivative part, and then the plugging in part, you're just like nuts to this. I'm just going to type the integral into my calculator and get the decimal from that. It's okay with me. Saves you some time, right? Some annoying, like plugging in values, which is like I know you can do it. You have the calculator. There's no reason you can't do it. It's just like slow. Unless you're like Mr. Kulik, who can do this, you know real fast in your head, which is not unreasonable expectation, but it's stre tests are stressful, you know? Victoria, you're, you're happy there? Okay. Um, Paul, is that a hand? Yeah. Can you do 23 6.4? 6.4, number 23? Yeah. Yeah, sure. That's probably one of those tricky yeah, son of guns, say, right? I'm not going to like that I'm asking you that one, but... Oh, I don't like that I assigned this one. It's like struggling to grasp it still. Yeah. Yeah, this does suck. Why did I do this to you guys? I should have just assigned like 21 and 22. Those would have been fine. <laughs> Is something like that going to be honest? No, but I think that those are hard enough, right? Like, 24 is awful. What did it, What was I thinking, guys? That's what I wanted. <laughs> I didn't assign 24. I didn't assign 24. Yeah, but 23, I was like, 23, 23 is not so bad. It's not horrible, but it's not lovely. Yeah, what, you were asking about 24, though? Oh, yeah. No, no, I'm asking about 23. Oh, okay. 23. Sorry. Okay. 
I was like, oh, what was I thinking looking at that? It's like, okay, this one is, it, you know, like, it's not great, but, okay. So, first thing to notice, when we talk about pumping this water out, two things are going to be changing at every instant. One is going to be the cross-sectional area of the water that you're moving. The second is the height. Everybody's okay with that? So, the work is going to be like some integral of that cross-sectional area function times the height. Well, we'll just say that. Yeah. Because really it's, I should say this, it's really more like that. Because this is the volume, right? At the volume of water that you're moving. And that's the distance you're moving at. Because really, the, uh, it's going to be the volume of water times the density times gravity. And that's the force. And then you have time x, which is the distance. Because work is just force times distance, right? So that's the way I'm going to think about it. OK. So let me think here for a minute. Um, so the area of any cross section in there I have this trapezoid. Well, let's just say, oh boy. I'm just trying to figure out the similar figure that I want to write. Let me look at what they did here. I have ideas, but before I go and I start writing a bunch of stuff wrong and everybody getting angry. Don't get angry! Let's just look here real quick. Okay, I see it. That's sneaky. All right, so let's take this piece here. I'm just going to redraw it off to the side. I'm going to draw that. This is 3. So what does this other piece next to it have to be? 3. And let's pick some height x. So this distance is x because we're emptying. What's this distance down here got to be then? 8 minus x. 
So this piece is x, and that piece over there is 8 minus x. And now I have enough for my similar triangle. So I can say that this triangle down here is going to be similar to this triangle here. So I can say 3 over 8 is equal to, um, call that R over um, 8 minus X. So that I get 8, uh, I just get R is equal to 3 eighths times 8 minus X. Okay, so still have a hard question here. Um, what shape is this area? Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a disk or a circle, right? What's the radius of that going to be? That's what I would have thought also, but they have, oh, yes, yes. So the radius of that disk is going to be this, correct? And I think now we have everything we need. Um, pump the water out of the spout, okay? So the work we're doing goes from 0 to 8. And it says in the problem to use the fact water weighs 62.5 feet or pounds per foot. That's our density. So we have pi times the radius with respect to x squared times the density, that's 65.2, times x dx. x is the height, right? Right, I, x is the distance that you have to pump the water. Uh, oops. No, that's still fine. That's good. Yep. And I think that's it. I think then you just integrate. That's your setup, though. Again, the trick was 
Notice where I started. I was just trying to write out what does my integral need to look like in terms of force times distance, right? I just think I would have probably never thought about the density of the abstract part. Like, I would have never thought that because Oh, yeah, and how, how come I, uh, I didn't do gravity, but why didn't I do gravity? It says ways, yeah, so a weight is a force already, so I didn't really need gravity. It was kind of baked into that density number they gave me. Because pounds is a force unit, not as opposed to like grams, which is not a force unit, it's a mass unit, which is just kind of irritating. Physicists, get your stuff together. Stop using weight as masses and masses as weight. So just like, ah! Does that feel okay though, Paul? Yeah. Yeah. What else do you guys got? Surge? Yeah, that's a toughie. Let me drop it in here. So first thing we need to do is figure out what uh, form our antiderivative is going to take so we can do our u-substitution. So take a look at your list to choose from. What does this look the most like? Yeah, very good. How could you tell it was inverse sine? And oh, I guess that's the only one, right? Because it's the only one with the square root in the denominator. OK, great. So the trick here now becomes I have to figure out a way to take this and rewrite it so it looks like that. How do we do that? Completing the square. That's how we're going to take a polynomial or a quadrat, any quadratic, and rewrite it as like one plus some u squared or one minus some u squared. So I'm going to cheat here a little bit to make the completing the square kind of trivial because we know how it's got to work. So I notice that this has to be of the form like 1 minus u squared, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add 1 and subtract 1. Everybody's okay that I can do that? So I'm going to factor the negative out. And this stuff should be, if it's if this problem is possible to do, that has to be a perfect square. 
So do you remember your perfect square factoring pattern? So it's that. So in our case, A has to be, if A squared is 4X squared, A is 2X. And B squared is 100, so B is 10. And now let's check. Does 2 times 2X times 10 give me negative 40? Or give me 40? 2 times 2x times 10, does that give me 40? Yes. 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 So that's that. So what do we have now? There's that. Oops, it's TX. Uh, what, are these, what are these called? What, what was this process? No, like what is, is completing the square? Like if I were to like look up on YouTube, like. Oh, this would be like integration by completing the square or something. Okay. Might be what they call it. We did this in the leftover section, so you could look at the lecture from that day also, um, the chapter five leftovers. Somewhere we did this. Of course, yeah. All right, so now that we've done this, I'm gonna do my u substitution. What's u got equal? Two x minus 10, so du dx is 2, so du over 2 is going to equal dx. Everybody's cool with that? Okay. So I'm going to have 12 over 2 integral of 1 over square root 1 minus u squared. Well, 12 over 2, oh, I forgot the du. 12 over 2 is just 6. And the antiderivative for 1 over 1 minus u squared is sine inverse u. And then I plug my u in, which was 2x minus 10. Am I done? Nope, I'm missing something. There you go. What do you give us the one that's hard with that? No, no, please don't. Look, 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 look. I just showed you the way to make it easy. All you need to do is recognize that completing the square doesn't really have to be done by completing the square. You can just kind of like fake it. Like, hey, I know this has to have a mi one minus or one plus. So all I need to do is like pull a one out of this thing. And then I have something that's a perfect square that's easy to factor and I boom, 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 boom. So you added one from the beginning and subtracted it from the next. Yes. Basically, I added one and subtracted one at the same time. I'm going to do that if I'm trying to use either tan inverse or sine inverse because the form of the antiderivative has... 1 minus x squared or 1 plus x squared. Mm -hmm. No, because if you do that, your du has a factor of x in it. And where is your, where do you, if you take, okay, if u is negative 4x squared plus 40x oh, minus 99, du dx is negative 8x plus 40, Where's your extra x? You solve again. Doesn't work that way, homie. Don't <laughs> <laughs>
We're going to do 7 1, but it won't be the whole time. It'll be like 45 and 45 or something. Wait, so are we just doing like from chapter 7? We're just doing 7 1. Well, no, we're going to circle back and hopefully do some more chapter 7 topics. But I want to do 7 1 because I think we need that to do some of the problems in chapter 9. I don't want to like run into a chapter nine problem where it's like, oh, you have to do that using integration by parts, which we haven't learned yet. Yeah. Which is why I'm, we're like doing this one thing from chapter nine, and then we're gonna do the or one thing from chapter seven, and then do chapter nine. Um, so like that is quite a lot of material. Are we going to be able to? Do that? Well, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Sergio, is that from from chapter nine. Yeah. I don't know that we need to do all of it. I'm still oh. kind of working through that. I probably don't need to do 9.6. Not sure that we need to do 9.5. Okay. The rest of these are BC topics that I would like to do, oh, yeah. but if we don't have time to do them, it's not the end of the world. Mm -hmm. It may be like, oh, we'll do like, you know, one or two of these and one of these or something, right. and like that's all we have time to do, and then we'll have, you know, like a couple of class periods where we just, we, do practice AP stuff, you know, like I assign it, you do it, we come through and go through things. Um, we're just gonna just kind of have to play it by ear. So in all reality, when I count this up, like I'd say there's like, you know, four or five more class periods to do chapter five or chapter nine, okay. and that's it that I need to do. I think you guys have what, like, I have like 17 or 16 more class days, not counting the asynchronous days. Yeah. Does that sound about right? Yeah. Um, I thought it was 37 yesterday was on the board. It's wrong, I think, though. Okay. No, Okay. But that's not bad. We can do, I can, we can handle that. Um, you know what I mean? Like, if I have like five days of like must have lectures, that's not bad. We're, we're, we'll probably have we'll probably have a week or two left over to do maybe a couple of these topics and then do some some review stuff. Yeah, I'm not. Look, look, homie. Look, homie. After chapter nine, there's going to be no more work that I'm going to ask you guys to turn in. Or do? I mean, if I like homework, I'm just saying. Yeah, no, no, yeah, that's what I mean. But there's like no more tests after after no after chapter nine. No more tests. Okay. Yeah, um, but that's that's kind of what we're looking at. Does that feel okay? Yeah. I think we're doing good time wise. I've really pushed you guys. Like we've gone quite quickly, quicker than maybe I would have liked to have been able to, or to have gone. But well, and I'm the first time I'm doing it, so it's still kind of where are we at at Christmas? Where are we at at you know Thanksgiving? Where were we at at winter break? Like I don't know what I need to, exactly where I need to be at yeah. um, to make sure that we have like some real time where I can just like assign some, you know, like here's an old AP exam, like do the multiple choice part at home. We're going to go through it the next day, you know, like do the, you know, like here's a set of free response questions, take them home, do them, we'll go through them the next day. Because I'd like to have a week or two where that's just what we do. Or just give you some stuff to practice on. I, I've, I've had a good time doing it. It's my first year I've done this. But...